evening and welcome to the September 29th edition of Global Nashville with Carl Dean. I'm Patrick Ryan, President of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Uh, this evening, we welcome uh, David Plazas uh, to our conversation with Mayor Dean. Uh, David Plazas is the Opinion and Engagement Director for the USA Today Network, Tennessee. He works as an editorial writer, opinion columnist, op-ed editor, and an editorial board member. He oversees the opinion team for the Tennessee and Nashville, the Knoxville News Sentinel, and the Memphis Commercial Appeal. And he frequently moderates community conversations in statewide and local political and policy debates. David is an award-winning journalist who wrote an acclaimed series on affordable housing, the cost of growth in Nashville, and he leads a statewide campaign, Civility Tennessee, to encourage, promote, and practice civil discourse and effective citizenship. David started his career at the News Press in Fort Myers, Florida, where he worked as a reporter, Spanish language community editor, opinion editor, and digital team leader. He holds a BA in political science in Spanish and an MS in journalism from Northwestern University and an MBA in marketing from Florida Gulf Coast University. David is a longtime mentor for young journalists. He has run a marathon. He gave his first TED Talks this month, and he admits to having become a good cook. David has numerous accolades and achievements noted on our webpage and on his LinkedIn page. You can check them out there. Too many to mention here. Carl, I think uh, we're off to do uh, a great program this evening. I'm looking forward to uh, your conversation with David. Great, thank you, Pat. And David, welcome. Welcome to the, to the podcast. It's good to have you. Good to see um, you, Carl. Thank you so much. And thank you, Pat, for that great introduction. Let me just um, start out by asking you how the pandemic um, has affected your work at the Tennessean. Um, what's, what's different than what it was seven months ago? Well, it's been an enormous change because of the uh, safer home orders. Uh, we at the Tennessean, we're now located on West End and 18th near Vanderbilt University. And most of our journalists are working from home or they're on the field but they're not coming to the office regularly, including myself. Until recently, I have been working there now once a week uh, as just kind of a practice, but it's through masking, social distancing, ensuring that uh, uh, you're not sick or have symptoms. Uh, and then from a standpoint of my daily work, I'm used to moderating a lot of events, as Pat had mentioned, and a lot of those events had been canceled. So I started a new venture, a podcast called Tennessee Voices, of which uh, Pat Ryan was the first guest uh, and we've uh, just published our 92nd episode today. Uh, and it's uh, with leaders, thinkers, innovators uh, to talk about what they're, what they're working on, what they're thinking about, and also how they're coping with this time. It's been a great time to talk about grace and humanity and how we can get through this together. Great. Have you, what have you done different in your own life to sort of cope with uh, the isolation or uh, not, you know, your life, I'm sure, was filled before this with meetings, constant contact with uh, reporters, the, the public in Nashville and around the state, and then all of a sudden things change. So how have you leveraged this or how have you, how have you survived it? You know, at first I wasn't sure I'd have enough, to, you know, enough to do, but the fact is it's gotten really busy, both because of internal projects and some external projects. So a lot of Zoom calling uh, on both the daily, I, I was asked by our news editors to be part of our daily news meetings, which has been very illuminating. I've gotten to know my colleagues uh, because now we're uh, part of a region. Our parent company, Gannett, merged with Gatehouse last year, uh, which means we have a lot of new properties. We've gone from about 107 or eight uh, pu publications to more than 250. And we're in a region that includes uh, five states, uh, Tennessee, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And so we've gotten to know a little bit more about our work and I've been able to get involved with different projects, including a uh, Confederate Reckoning Project, which is about examining uh, the history of Confederate monuments, why they exist where they are and the conversations around them. Uh, so even though I'm not physically present in a lot of spaces, um, I've been able to be extremely present in conversations. And the podcast, which is recorded via Zoom, much like this, has been a great way to keep in touch with people uh, who extend in the higher education world, the political world, uh, and people who are working in, in healthcare, for example. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about issues uh, of healthcare access, which has been something that's been on my mind. Um, and I've always enjoyed that particular type of reporting, uh, but it's been even more so with the pandemic. And I understand that you've um, made a special effort to 
I don't know, improve or advance your cooking ability? How, is, how did you get inspired to do that and how is that going? It was going really well. Uh, so a few years ago, I actually burned eggs and burned rice. So I was never a very good cook. Uh, and um, uh, so my husband and I, we started getting um, uh, the, the uh, Hello Fresh, which is kind of like a Blue Apron, you know, food delivered at home because we had a lot more time. We worked we, for a while, if you remember, we couldn't go out anywhere. And so um, I had to learn, we had to learn to make do uh, and learn how to create a pattern because it was at the time in March where you had to ration your toilet paper and your paper towels and uh, really be mindful of, of what you had because it might be all you had. Um, and, and I really got into it as a, a point of, of catharsis because I needed to have some stress relief from my phone especially. So when I cook, I put my phone down, don't even look at it and spend half an hour to an hour just examining, understanding salt and heat. You know, I've read that book, uh, Salt, Fat, ha Acid and Heat, and which has been remarkable in understanding the physics of food. And then also the culture behind it all, you know, what does it mean exactly to eat in certain ways? And, and that's kept me very excited because even though I had my day job, I have to stay involved with a very contentious presidential election and local elections, cooking in itself has become a way to connect with, um, with other cultures. Uh, and, and I've also become pretty good at it. I'm, I'm not afraid to salt anymore. So I used to, afraid to oversalt things, but now I know what it does. Well, tell us a little bit um, about yourself in terms of where you were brought up, uh, what got you into journalism, um, you know, what, what motivates you? Sure, yes, I, I was born and raised in Chicago. My father is from Colombia in South America. My mother is from Cuba. Uh, we were raised bilingual and uh, was raised with a lot of family around. Um, you know, my grandparents were a very big part of my life. So learning those cultural traditions were really important. Music was really important in our lives. Um, I have uh, at one time played the violin and the trumpet. I was never very good at those, but I did get into singing. I became very good. Um, but I'd always wanted to be, when I was a kid, a lawyer. Uh, I was told by my, my dad, essentially, there was this view, especially as an immigrant dad, that you were gonna either be a lawyer, a doctor, or an engineer, uh, because that was what was gonna be lucrative. And I chose a, a pre-law path because um, I enjoyed writing. Uh, but I uh, worked for a lawyer and then started doing some more writing on my own. Uh, and it was from a study abroad opportunity back in college. Uh, it was in Seville, Spain, where I was writing for a magazine and really enjoying telling people stories and thinking to myself, you know, what if I could get paid to do this, to just, you know, travel around, talk to people, tell their stories, um, you know, relate these things, connect people together. And uh, one of my mentors, uh, you know, this is at a time we were still doing long form writing, you know, from Spain to the United States said, you need to, you can't go to law school. Um, and I you know, disappointed my dad at first. Thankfully, he's happy with me now, but at the time it was uh, not a great conversation, but it was a wonderful career path for me because it's, it was my passion. Um, and in part, it was to tell stories, but at the same time to create connections between communities. And I started off as a, as a police reporter uh, and my first weekend on the job uh, in Fort Myers, Florida, was there was a, a, a three homicides that happened that same weekend. So I, I got an early education very quickly in how to understand different cultures, be it covering the culture of the police or um, communities that felt um, underserved and at times who felt who had hostile feelings toward the police. Really understanding that conversation that we're having today, 20 years ago when I first started in journalism. And I really uh, focused, I, I was transferred to the education beat for a while, which to me, education is one of the most important topics. Um, and while I don't have children, um, I really learned to appreciate the tough choices that administrators, city officials, um, parents have to make and all the competing aims. And I, I, you make me think about you, Carl, because of all the challenges that you had to face as mayor of Nashville, because you have so many interests that you have to balance and very rarely are, is everybody happy. Um, and so covering those things is, is, uh, was really, really important to me. Uh, Pat had mentioned that I had been a Spanish language editor. I, because I studied Spanish, uh, I speak Spanish fluently, I write it, uh, I can report in Spanish, and it was a great opportunity to connect a group of new Americans in Southwest Florida who um, did not speak English uh, for the most part and uh, were just wanting to get a, have a good job and, and, and live in society. And it was very tough because um, it was uh, at a time where, where people were very hostile and the conversations around immigration were around. This was back in 2006, you may recall, there was an effort to criminalize um, undocumented immigrants coming in. It was the Sensenbrenner bill, um, 
by Congressman, I think from Wisconsin, I believe. Uh, and so we did a lot of work in terms of trying to understand what does that mean exactly. And so my coverage was as much local and it also had to be international because I had to understand the cultures, the, the, the traditions. The, the, um, so I would talk a lot to consuls general, um, like whether Mexico or Guatemala especially, uh, but to understand exactly what the situation was and what the options were. You know, another theme uh, that I got into very much during that time was that of human trafficking. Um, there was a lot of, uh, many cases of uh, agricultural workers who had been trafficked or women who were trafficked um, and, uh, you know, to, to be sex slaves essentially. And so these were very deep topics and telling those stories and also telling stories of, of, of people who were freed, of people who had a new life. That was uh, pretty amazing to me uh, to be able to share those stories and you know, provide dignity for people who otherwise might be seen uh, because they were different, might be seen um, suspiciously. In terms of your career, um, when you got into journalism, did you start in Chicago and then move to Florida? Is that how it worked or? Yes, so, so Florida, the news press was the first place that would pay me to do my job. So that's why I went to Florida. Uh, although I, I went to, to college in Chicago, uh, went with a recruiter from my company, Gannett, and was offered two jobs. One was either to go to Fort Myers, Florida, or to go to Gainesville, Georgia, which is in the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, in Georgia. And I chose Florida only because I had relatives over there and, and thought it was a great opportunity to be by the beach and at the same time do some journalism. And it ended up being a very, a rich place. I was there for 14 years, um, and and in many ways because of the the opportunities to grow as a reporter, a community weekly editor, and later getting involved in the opinion space. And back in 2006, when I became an opinion editor, I was I was very young. I was in my late 20s, and my task was to you know essentially completely disrupt everything that had to do with an opinion editor. That it was no longer going to be the individual who was in the office opining on something and you know, speaking at the world, it was not gonna be a person who was very much rooted in the community, creating events around public policy ideals, be it education or be it about the economy, uh, and, and, and also writing about uh, topics with expertise where deep reporting came in and it wasn't just opining. And uh, at the time that was considered extremely radical uh, in our business. Some people still do it, consider it radical today, but um, coming to Nashville, one of the things I found so wonderful about it back in 2014 is that you had a community that really expects you to be engaged and expects you to be involved. And, um, and that was a great opportunity for me to, to hold conversations on affordable housing or the state of the economy. Uh, or one of my last public events was uh, participating in a volunteer activity for recovery in North Nashville after the tornado. Uh, and being able to be among people who um, had this mutual interest to see things better, that was, that was really, really exciting. So how was it when you got to Miami, you grew up in Chicago and you have the uh, Columbia, Columbia and Cuban background, mm -hmm. and then you arrive in- In Fort Myers, yeah. Florida, yeah, in Fort Myers in Florida, where you're suddenly, I think the exposure to Hispanic culture and to the influence of Latin American on the US I assume was exponentially greater or, or was it? It, it was in, in many ways, even though like with my family, uh, you know, it was, I grew up in a very um, Latino oriented, a lot of the cultural traditions, you know, we had, you know, beans and rice along with our turkey and Thanksgiving. And, you know, we had a lot of things that we kept that were, were traditional, uh, but it definitely was externally, uh, like in Chicago, you wouldn't find, you know, a, a Cuban coffee place on almost every block, you know, like you would in South Florida. Uh, and, uh, you know, and also the fruits. I mean, that was one thing that I, I, I do miss um, of South Florida is just the fresh tropical fruits that are just absolutely delicious and are part of that tradition and, and that conversation. But it was um, definitely a shift. And they were going through actually a very interesting time in the early 2000s where there was a lot of um, uh, migration from Latin America, either because of political reasons, such as in Venezuela, because of Hugo Chavez at the time, or, um, or for economic reasons, people were coming to find a better place. So you started, you know, Miami itself used to be predominantly Cuban, and now you see a mix of different Latino populations because of the migration of a political situation there. And, and that's uh, created, in some cases, a beautiful mix, and in other cases, some tremendous tension uh, because of the, what the, the implications are for politics. So as a journalist, I always found it tremendously fascinating uh, just to be there. Um, but so I also- In 2014, you, you came to Nashville? Mm -hmm, I did. And what, so what was behind that move is that you were reassigned and asked to do what? 
Sure. So um, 2014, our company had reorganized our newsrooms across the country. And so many of us were being asked to apply for, our, uh, for new jobs. In some cases, there weren't as many jobs as there had been before. And I um, made a decision at that moment that I was not going to stay in my newsroom because I said it was a great opportunity to do other things, be it in journalism or not. Or not. Uh, and my, um, my good friend, Carol Hudler, who was the former publisher of the Tennessean and was my boss in Florida years ago, called me and, and said, you know, you really should think about it. And I, my first reaction was, do I need to like country music if I go up there? And she said, uh, no, but you should learn to appreciate it. And, um, and she was right. And, and today, I, the Country Music Hall of Fame is one of my favorite places to visit, um, uh, learning about the deep, rich traditions. And, and also, because I had never been to Nashville before my interview, I had these preconceived notions of what it was. Uh, and some of it was true based upon media of, of the Grand Ole Opry, for example, and, um, and which is also a wonderful thing as well. And others like the, the food traditions and just the diverse diversity of music was something that was great. You know, going to a jazz concert, you know, with, with, or a gospel, you know, things that are also very rich here in Nashville was wonderful. Was the city more, um, was Nashville more cosmopolitan, more diverse than what you expected? Yes. Uh, so, for example, um, Fort Myers community is very conservative politically. It's a very red county. Uh, coming to Nashville, I think one of the first things I saw, and it was, I, I saw it with, with tremendous joy because there was a lot of fear, especially among the Muslim population in Fort Myers, to be out, for example, with a hijab, whereas in Nashville downtown, that was something that I saw. I said, wow, this is, this is really nice to see the fact that, uh, and you deserve, obviously, tremendous amounts of credit as mayor for the New Americans office and, um, uh, you know, for creating an environment that was very welcoming to foreigners. So thank you for, for doing that. Yeah, because I think, of, well, I think that's a key to a successful city is to have people coming in and, and diversity is a big part of it. I think one of the things that, um, that probably most Nashvillians, when they think of you, think about civility. Uh, your manners are impeccable. <laughs> um, but you have spent a lot of time, and I think very commendably, and, and hopefully you're getting good feedback, and, and it's the right thing to do. But talking about civility, how it's important for us, particularly in politics and mm -hmm. social issues, to be able to talk to each other, um, not always agree, but have a basic civil discourse. So maybe I guess what I'd like you to do is first tell me about um, your interest in that topic and how do you define civility? Um, Absolutely. I will tell you that I was terrified to address it. My boss challenged me, so I'm going to admit that up front. Uh, we had just gone through this very successful affordable housing uh, series, and he, this was at the end of 2017, and said, you really should think about civil discourse. We need we need to do this. And I'm thinking, does anybody want civility anymore? Uh, and, uh, but, I, but I rose to the challenge because, um, you know, in part, I, I also knew it was important. You know, I, I, the, you know, people unfriending each other, these echo chambers, the nastiness, it just wasn't healthy uh, for democracy. And, you know, if we were going to be a successful society, we needed to find some way to frame conversations so we at least could be in the same room with each other. Uh, and one of the things I've learned, because civility is a very controversial term too. It can be off-putting to people who've been told to be silent or who have been told that civility is about decorum, uh, that you could you know, pass a terrible piece of legislation as we have sometimes seen in the Tennessee legislature with a smile on your face, but that's not civil. You know, in my mind, civility comes, the Latin root, kiwitas, is all about the citizen's role in upholding, sustaining, and defending society and challenging society to do better and defending the rights of all and not just the rights of, of the few. Um, so I think that that's where civility um, sometimes gets a bad rap because people associate it just with politeness. Because I, I get very angry about things as well, but I also realize that I don't have a luxury to be openly angry because that will um, essentially ruin everything that I've tried to do, which is how do you speak to each other in ways where kindness comes first, where understanding and listening comes first, and if you're going to be angry, cook or run. So I'll do one of those two things to, to distract myself. Um, but it, it is tough because, um, especially this year in 2020, we obviously have terrible examples at the political level of people who debase each other, who um, um, are nasty to each other. And the question is, you know, we don't have to be like that. You know, we we can do better. And I am a big fan of local politics because I think there's greater opportunities for understanding at the city council, city level, where people can start 
talking because you know you're shopping with these people you're you know maybe going to the same house of worship maybe you're you let you've seen each other at a museum and you know suddenly you can turn an issue you know as as trite as it can be but i, I think you can appreciate this you know like a wastewater treatment issue you know why do i have to put that there you can have healthy conversations around those things and those are important because i think at the end of the day it's about quality of life um and oftentimes people do not know how to start these conversations and civility tennessee was all about creating spaces for people to understand how to frame them be it on issues like racism gun violence uh, sexual assault uh, and, uh, and and also create events uh, so we had our largest event was at lipscomb university uh, congressman cooper jim cooper was there along with uh, secretary of state trey hargett uh, and and uh, senator steve dickerson so you had a couple of republicans shana huey from think tennessee who were talking about an issue that is very near and dear to my heart, voting. And why is it that Tennessee is got a terrible ranking when it comes to voter turnout and finding ways to try to address what the issue is and how do you help turn the tide? Uh, I was uh, really pleased by the voter turnout from this election in August, and I'm hopeful that it'll be that, that in November as well, because part of it is claiming your power and your citizenship. And I'm just so excited about some of the efforts to drive voter turnout, especially among young people. That's been something that's been, been very gratifying to me. And I think that's an example of civility. So, so what else, um, what do we need to be doing as a city or as a community? I mean, um, you're leading a discussion, you're working to help create events, um, you're encouraging people through your writing and um, through speaking on being civil in the context of social and political relationships. Um, what else could we do as a, as a city to make that happen? What, what should the World Affairs Council, how can we contribute? So I'm glad you asked, because my biggest obsession these days is fighting disinformation and misinformation. And you made me think about, I was in Transit Leadership Academy years ago, where we studied the AMP situation many years ago, which I know is, is tough, uh, forgive me if I brought it up, but I only bring it up in the context of, you know, fighting misinformation is so hard. You know, the moment you put something out there that is incorrect, it's very hard to pull it back. And I worry about this right now with the potential tax referendum that's gonna be, if, if the elections commission decides to put it on, on the December ballot, uh, what will that mean for the state of the city finances? What we'll be able to do, because it's very, you know, obviously it's very easy to say, I don't want my taxes high, you know, and, and I think this is unfair and, you know, and. You know, the, the question is, what kind of arguments can we come together where we say, okay, we understand that this is not an optimal situation, but here are the consequences if we take this path. Um, and, and I think we need that more than ever right now, because otherwise noise is just going to drown out reason and we need right. people to be calm. Well, do you think that we're moving as a city, a state, a nation? Are we moving in the right direction or are you think we got a long, long way to go? I, th I think it's an everyday conversation because, uh, you know, November 3rd is a mystery to all of us, uh, myself, and, and one result is, is going to make me more upset than the other one. <laughs> but, um, but the reality is we have to, you know, this is going to be the result that it is. And the question is, what's, what's the consequence? You know, people have threatened violence, people, but that's not, that's, that's a, a, the most uncivil act. You know, what do we do to, it, it, not not to silence dissent because that's the worst thing we could do but the question is how do we harness that in a way that's going to be very effective you know one of these ways you know i think of even uh, tennessee world affairs council's youth programs where you help people understand their world in different ways um i was talking to one of my guests on my podcast uh, about her using the calm meditation app to help her get through it because too often we get so consumed with the world that you know we need those spaces to be able to to decompress because otherwise it becomes too much. Um, one of my biggest, this is a little bit of a digression, but I promise I'll come back to your question. Uh, one of the trends that I've been following very carefully uh, and sadly is the rise in substance abuse uh, deaths, issues and mental health diagnoses. So we're in a critical situation uh, and because the COVID-19 has taken so much of the space, we're not hearing as much about it as, and the data's out there, but we're just not hearing about it as much. And so we need to find ways to heal each other, you know, to find ways for this mutual understanding. And, and as I tell people, we don't all have to like each other, you know, but you know, it's almost like a Thanksgiving dinner, a family Thanksgiving dinner. You don't, you may not like all your relatives at the table, 
but what can you do to be in the space together to at least understand each other for that moment? And who knows, it may yield better conversations. Um, I, I've had that experience here in Nashville. Um, I certainly have had my share of disagreements with people and I think being able to sit down and understand, and even if we leave still um, not agreeing with each other, there's a mutual respect that, okay, I, I know that you're gonna pick up my call if I call you and, and vice versa. So maybe we can resolve other problems where we have some mutual interests. And you've done work, um, you've mentioned with the Confederacy Project where you've looked at um, monuments and things. Mm -hmm. I think civility would be in, in that particular area would be one that is uh, civility is needed and probably a great testing area to see how these concepts actually get executed. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Sure, and, and I'll start by saying that anger, I think, is a very legitimate emotion. Um, and what I tell a lot of people that I mentor about anger is that you have to be careful not to let it consume you because then you might not be in a position to use that anger effectively to move the needle because the Confederate uh, monument um, discussion is one that makes people angry. You know, when you, when, when, whether it's because you're wanting to sustain those monuments or whether you see them as such horrible racist uh, symbols that you want to just remove them. And one of the things that's, I think, really hard is that we've created barriers in government. You know, now you, you might have to go to three commissions before getting rid of the Nathan Bedford Forest statue, and it just it creates a farce, you know, and I think that that's, that's the opposite of civility. One, so one of the remedies is, of course, voting, and it's, and it's difficult, especially when you have a, a state legislature where you have many areas that are politically in a particular er, er, direction. But I think the healthy conversation is one that, um, and, and I'll, I'll give a shout out, I might get in trouble for this, but Jeremy Faison from uh, East Tennessee, I think he came away with the idea that, and he's, he's a representative uh, from Knoxville who um, is no longer supportive of Nathan Bedford Forrest because he took a moment to listen to a friend of his who's African American and finally understood why that was harmful. And now he's one of the biggest boosters for getting rid of the bust. Um, and, and I think that those kinds of conversations are important. Um, the bill that recently passed, uh, if I remember correctly, Senate Bill 8005, 8 which would make, which makes camping overnight a felony on state property, I think that's a very uncivil bill. It's, it's one that punishes, essentially goes after protesters and a kind of protest. And that in itself, you know, should make us angry. You know, that is going after our First Amendment rights, our right to petition the government, our, our right to assemble. Uh, and again, it's going to be a process. You know, and, and then sometimes the courts help us out. You know, today it was announced that the Court of Appeals um, agreed with with the judge in the case of vouchers that it's unconstitutional here in Tennessee. Uh, so, you know, that that often is, is why I think I think one of the things that uh, would be helpful um, and, and it's hard is helping people understand how government works because I, I've often told people like I've seen people go to the state legislature and advocate for a federal issue. And there's an opportunity to have the conversation, say your passion is in the right place, but you're not in the right place to have that conversation. You should be going to um, your senator's office or, um, or if you can, you know, Washington DC or in some way advocate for ways that are very well directed. Um, this has been a really interesting time too, because I've had numerous conversations with my own relatives and some friends about federalism. You know, we often don't think about it too much, but it's, it's come to high gear with who is responsible for the response for COVID when it comes to personal protective equipment or, or, you know, or the vaccine, you know, and, and you have some governors who are more active than others. You have the mask mandate issues. Uh, my, um, my concern you know, with, with that conversation is that people, because they don't know what to believe, uh, that suddenly you have a little bit of chaos there in the public square. Um, one of the things that I do, especially in the mask issue, I, I am, I'm a mask wearer, so when I'm out, I wear my mask. And uh, if people ask me about it, it's as a point of hospitality, not as a point to offend you, but because I don't want you to be sick. Because you, 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 I may be sick, you know, you may be sick. Why don't we protect ourselves? Um, and that creates a whole new conversation rather than, you know, I can't believe you didn't support my position on this. Right. Um, and, yeah. yeah, and then also on this time period, we've had the whole, and talk about, emotion. I mean, there's emotion all through the country in response to the death of Mr. Floyd, the, the various um, instances of, uh, of black uh, individuals 
being killed, uh, interacting with the police. And you've had this spontaneous, um, really uh, hadn't been matched in, in years in terms of people going to the streets and saying enough is enough. And, and how does that, you know, and then there's all sorts of different reactions. I think we can all agree that the vast majority of protests have been peaceful. Certainly there have been examples where it has not been. Um, but when, when something of that extreme ha happens, like um, the death of Mr. Floyd, what, how do you have a civil conversation? I mean, it's probably the most important time ever to have it because there's so much on the line, the injustice is so clear um, and the emotions are so raw, but how do you, how do you initiate those conversations? Yeah, you know, it's, it's very challenging. I think uh, going to the point of listening and understanding what your privilege is, you know, me as a lighter skinned person, I, um, you know, I, I, with, with my friends who are black, you know, I want to listen first before speaking. Um, that's one thing. And, and I, I mentioned the friendship aspect because one thing I've learned in my time is that facts don't change people's minds, but relationships can. And by having that initial relationship, you might be able to start persuading. And I started seeing a very interesting trend after George Floyd's murder, which was people who normally would be on perhaps a more, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to say pro-police, but certainly not a sympathetic side, were starting to say, this is awful. I can't believe that happened. They, they saw the footage and then they believed. And sometimes it takes that kind of visceral reaction to something to, to tell you, we need to have some common facts. The common facts is that this man was unjustly killed. So, you know, whether or not you have a particular point of view of, of him or what happened or how it was handled, that's the one common fact that I've started to see, thankfully, people agree on. You know, the question that you mentioned about um, the perception of what's going on in the streets, uh, you know, are, some politicians are, you know, are, uh, have uh, incendiary um, uh, rhetoric, which is saying there's riots all over America. This is simply not true. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, it takes that one conversation at a time. Uh, one of the things that I try to counsel, especially my colleagues on, is to be very mindful of their social media habits, because uh, I, I believe that you shouldn't tweet something you can't defend. Um, you know, if you are, uh, not only because it's potentially career killing and reputation killing, but because you could be um, essentially uh, uh, sharing incorrect information or skewed information. The question is, what is the point of these conversations? You know, if they are to pick at each other, we've seen that it's not healthy at all. Um, the science right now and, and the, the research that I've shown both in psychology and sociology shows that people, when they comment on social media without someone physically being present there, are uh, less likely to have their inhibitions. Um, uh, and so they're more likely to be perhaps snarky, perhaps mean, uh, and that further adds to the distrust. Now, one good piece of news is that most of America is not on Twitter, uh, even though we might, we journalists and politicians might think that, <laughs> that everybody in the world is on Twitter, but the most people aren't. But it's still a place where voices are amplified tremendously, where misinformation and disinformation goes out. Um, and, you know, one of the conversations related to um, this, to the issue after George Floyd's murder was, defunding the police. What exactly does that mean? Because that word means different things to different people uh, and it can be triggering. And I have a young columnist, uh, LeBron Hill, who works on my team. And I asked him, he's writing a column right now about the police chief search in Nashville. And I said, uh, I said to him, what do you think when you see a policeman, what's your reaction? And he says, when I'm wearing my reporter hat, I feel like, okay, this person is here to protect my home. When I go back to my childhood memories and the trauma that I had as a black child growing up with violence around, I'm terrified. And it was this really interesting reaction because it's, I think, I think he's not alone in feeling this, but by listening to it, you know, I think it was cathartic for him to address that, to come out and say, this is how I feel about this person. And I've also had police, police tell him, he's had police tell him that they've never met a black person and say they don't know how to react to them. And so, uh, you know, it, it's a very difficult thing. It, it takes this one conversation at a time and it takes, you know, bold leaders like yourselves to go out there and bring people together, maybe sometimes kicking and screaming a little bit, but just to say, you know, we have to, we have to face each other. And, and that's what creates empathy. You know, the ability to look at each other, look at each other in the eye. And at the end of the day, and I'll give you a quick example. We had a group of gun owners that I invited to the Tennessee in a few years ago to have a conversation on how to talk about gun rights. And initially, I was not sure if this was going to work out very well. It ended up being a great time because people 
most of these people had never met a journalist before. So they had these preconceived notions about who we were, you know, the, all the usual enemy of the people, all that other stuff. And then they realized you guys are, you guys are decent people. You guys <laughs> are human. Uh, and we said the same thing to them. And there was a very interesting conversation surrounding responsibility and gun ownership. And it helped us understand the issues from their perspective much better. And, you know, we may have come out there with different points of view still, but there was that mutual respect. We're like, okay, we can have this understanding of this trust. And I think that's where that starts. Yeah. Well, it's important work and I commend you for, for doing it. And I think certainly this year with all the events that have occurred, the importance of talking to each other and truthfulness and facts are, are, are big deals. Um, so this show is Global Nashville and we're the World Affairs Council. And um, what's your sense of how Nashville- I, I, knew, I knew you were gonna get around to that, Carl. <laughs> so what, what's your sense about how we're doing as a city, as a, as a people here uh, in terms of handling the diversity that um, I think has, has happened faster than people expected. And it's much more, um, there's more depth to it than people realize. Um, and I think it's made the city a much richer place and this in terms of so many different ways. But how, how do you think we're doing? I, th I think overall, in my nearly six years here, I think we're doing very well. I think where the issues come in is where you get the politics involved of whether or not, you know, uh, for example, immigration and customs enforcement should have certain information on people just because they're undocumented, when that becomes a political issue, or when the issue of refugee um, come in where you don't know who the refugees are. I just had, uh, today I had on my podcast, um, Lisa Sherman Nicholas, the executive director of the Tennessee Immigrant Refugee Rights Coalition to talk about how she helps put policy together that helps people see the other as human. And her members are, um, they tell their stories. Uh, one of the things that is my favorite thing to do in Nashville is the food uh, tourism. You know, going to different places on Nolensville Corridor, going to, you know, places that, that I've never been to, whether it was Ethiopian food or um, uh, there's a Cuban place uh, like on Trousdale and, and, you know, and, and get to know the food, get to know the people. Um, and when my, my concern, I think the diversity is something that over, overwhelmingly is, tends to be accepted from my vantage point, although I'm certainly maybe biased because I'm coming in from an urban perspective. Um, I am concerned about the the economic displacement, and this is something that's affecting every single city in America. You know, this whole notion of home prices getting so high that suddenly you see communities that lack any diversity at all. Uh, you know, my own neighborhood of Salem Town has become that way, uh, where it's become predominantly white and and upper middle class. Um, and certainly, I'm not complaining about my neighbors from that standpoint, but there is a lack of understanding of what used to be there, which is a predominantly African American neighborhood. Um, and so, I, I still think we have many issues when it comes to um, understanding our relationship with our African American neighbors. When it comes to international visitors and foreign born people, I see, um, at least my perspective, is that I've, I've seen a lot more acceptance. And I don't know if that's because um, of the nature of. Um, and forgive me if I'm using the right word, but the, kind of the segregated nature of the city, um, you know, in terms of that there are certain populations that have tended to live in areas, whether it's South Nashville or whether it's here. And, and that's a whole other conversation that we can certainly get into. Uh, but uh, one of the things that makes me hopeful though, um, thanks to Pat and, and thanks to my other connections, I've met with many consuls general and just had um, uh, consul general uh, Staunton, Andrew Staunton of, of the UK was, was on the podcast a few days ago and talking about the great cultural opportunities and exchanges between the United Kingdom and, and Nashville. And my conversations with people outside of Nashville, they still see this as this, this shining city, this amazing place full of opportunity. Um, and you know, people can't wait to get more London flights out there to, to, from Nashville there and, uh, and to see this as a city that's just gonna thrive. And we're just going through a very rough spot right now with the economy and the tornado, the derecho, the, uh, the pandemic. Um, but I, I, you know, I think it's, it's been years of, you know, your leadership, your predecessor's leadership that have helped make the city a, a, a very open, open place because we know cities that are open, that are cosmopolitan grow. Uh, now there's an interesting trend. And I, I don't know if I have time to ask you a question <laughs> where, where we're seeing people go into, um, you know, leave the city for the country or smaller towns precisely because of the pandemic. And I don't know if that's just a temporary situation or what that's going to do for things like commercial real estate, for things like entertainment activities in downtowns? 
But I think it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in the resiliency of cities. Um, and I, I do think that a city like Nashville is probably in a better position to recover fully um, and even maybe come out stronger um, from the pandemic because it is such a center of culture, um, of universities, of um, entrepreneurship. There is a positive result that comes from having these people together. It's not like people are just together to create a big population. They're, they're together because they're exchanging ideas, they're creating companies, they're creating music, they're creating an education. Um, and I think that will, that will be, still be an appeal when we get to the other side of this. I mean, if it's like the, you know, the 1920, 1919, 1920 uh, pandemic, it will end. Mm -hmm. and we'll go back to a new normal. There'll be changes. I mean, commercial real estate, um, we'll see how that all develops. I, I, think, I think it will come back in, in, in a different form, but it'll, it'll definitely come back. Um, but I, long term, I, I, just, uh, I, have, uh, I have the utmost confidence in the city. I really do. I, I think um, people will, will want to be here. Um, and, and so overall, I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I would think so too. I mean, I think my experience has been overwhelmingly positive in the city. It's been a very welcoming city. Uh, you know, being in the role that I'm in, you know, perhaps akin to, to a degree to someone who's been in elective office is that you're constantly in conflict with certain people. So that's just a, a reality of the daily life. Um, but there's so many beautiful opportunities to connect with with folks who generally want to get to know you, who generally want to share their their culture and their experiences with you, be it the meet and three culture, or be it you know someone who's a recent um, refugee from Egypt or from from Iraq, uh, and and so th this has been one of the things that's been really really gratifying to see a council that has a Muslim American Nigerian American woman and Sofat Swara, for example, um, or Sandra Sepulveda, who is uh, the first Latina uh, uh, in in the council. Uh, and then also to have people who you know represent very traditional areas. I think the one thing that I, I found very illuminating a few years ago, this was the first year of Civility Tennessee back in 2018, I was taking a, a lift ride with a driver who was taking me back home, seeing the skyline of downtown. And she was looking at it, she, she basically told me, it's like, you know, people like you are what's ruining this city. I'm, I'm like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> and, and she apologized, but she said, you know, those of you who are relatively new, and she had been uh, a Madison native and had lived there all her life. And she just didn't recognize that. That wasn't Nashville to her. Nashville was the outskirts. Nashville was uh, suburban or rural. Uh, and it was a really interesting conversation because uh, it was about all about change, of how do you manage change? And, and that can be very difficult. What I came away very gratified by is that at least she no longer saw me as, as some horrible person by the end of our ride. You know, we, we, she understood why I came here. You know, it's not just, I mean, people, I think in a city like Nashville, it does have a lot of tradition and, and I think a Southern culture has a lot of that. But, you know, the city of Boston, for instance, is a different place than it was 20 years ago too, or 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's much more diverse. It's much more, there's a lot of new people coming in. And the same is happening in every sort of successful American city. I mean, you know, I think it's happening probably to a higher degree in Nashville because I think we've had a bigger growth spurt than most a lot of places have. But the cities that are working are, you know, it's just life. The cities that are working are places that are growing and places that are diverse and are able to work through that and accept that and see that as a strength. Um, but I'm sensitive to people's, you know, people, a lot of change is hard. I mean, it's, mm. it's, it sounds trite, but that's, that's, that's. Well, this has been a great conversation. I have, um, I hope Pat, I've done all right, keeping it relatively on track. Um, oh, I think, I think, uh, I agree. This, uh, this is a terrific conversation. And David, uh, I, I would just like to mention a couple of things before we go. Uh, first, congratulations on your first place in the Tennessee Press Association Awards for your uh, best personal column. Thank you. Uh, I, I follow that, and I know it's uh, your efforts with a young student uh, that you read to regularly and, and you talked about that and uh, that just demonstrates the generosity of your spirit that we have all come to know and, and appreciate uh, you for. So congratulations on that. Any, anything you'd like to mention about that award or that particular project that? Uh... Oh, sure, I, you know, it was about reading with a, a five-year-old kindergartner and who I came away always energized. It was at Buena Vista Elementary School, which 
uh, sadly was closed uh, uh, for the school year. Um, but every time, you know, I was supposed to read with him for an hour through the Pencil Foundation, and he only wanted to read for a little bit. He wanted to draw and play. And at first, I was a little bit flustered. I'm like, I'm supposed to read to you, and realized over several months that, in fact, this was, he wanted just personal connection with someone who'd given that attention and wanted to do something creative. And, and I just came away. Um, so, I mean, it was very sad after the tornado and the pandemic that yeah, I couldn't do it anymore. So, I, but it's still one of the highlights of, my, of the last year. And tell us about your TED Talk uh, earlier this month. Sure. Uh, so the TED Talk was all about creating spaces for public disagreement. So about the Civility Tennessee Project um, and looking at civility from a standpoint as, as you know, Carl's very, very uh, wonderful questions were, were, wasn't as civility in the traditional polite sense, but really civility as being about the citizen's responsibility, you know, to help improve and challenge society. Uh, because that, that's one of my biggest uh, concerns right now is that, um, you know, I, I went to Catholic school. I only mentioned that because we were taught to be very uh, nice and respectful, and, and, but that to kind of decorum can be good to a point, but it doesn't really help you speak to conversations, when, especially when people are, are angry. A um, um, good mutual friend of ours, I'll, I can tell you after the, uh, who it is after that, but you might be able to guess, talks about uh, the place for obscenity. You know, when, you have, when someone has done something to you that is so terrible, how can you possibly civilly discuss it? And that's a good point. And, and she gave me some homework to do. And that homework started with, you're gonna to have to take some time to do the work and listen. And then afterwards, we're gonna be able to get to step, maybe step one, step two, after a few weeks of this, and it worked. You know, and it takes time, this, this takes a lot of work. I'll have to get a copy of that homework. I was a sailor for 26 years, so uh, we occasionally come out with some interesting things. But uh, let me ask, uh, ask uh, just to, to uh, close the loop on Nashville as a global city, um, what, what is it uh, that's remarkable to you about uh, the place? There's no Cuban coffee shop every other block, but there must be something in particular that you enjoy. Uh, I know I've seen you at the, uh, the Emperor's birthday and, and uh, <laughs> that's always a, a good gig, but uh, what, uh, what about Nashville do you like that uh, would be in the global city category? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that combination of cultures, and I had the, the pleasure of, of uh, had being in the building now with the Japanese Consul General, and I've gotten to know, I think, I think I'm on my fourth in my time here in Nashville, uh, Consul General. The Emperor's birthday is wonderful, but I've had the opportunity to go to the Emperor's, uh, or to the Consul General's res residence for dinner uh, to learn cultural traditions. I regret that I have not yet learned Japanese, uh, but, um, but the, the, just the food and, uh, it's just, and the conversations are wonderful. So those are some of my, my favorite memories. Um, and, you know, and also really getting to know people from, you know, where they're coming from. Conexión Americas, for example, I've, I've developed a very good relationship, whether it was with Renata Soto, who was the previous executive director, uh, or now um, uh, Juliana. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and we have, I think it's a great organization that does work to empower people. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's so many organizations like that that, that impress me. Tennessee World Affairs Council, and I'm, I'm sucking up to you, Pat, but, but I, you've given me the privilege of having these, of moderating these amazing conversations, whether it's with Ambassador Pickering, with a, a Turkish dissident journalist, even with um, many fascinating people that have enriched my intellectual life and have helped me have better conversations with people. Um, oh, I was gonna, gonna give you a, a big hat tip for that because whenever we have distinguished visiting speakers in town, you've been generous with your time to uh, entertain them for conversations down at the Tennessean building and uh, also to join us uh, moderating for our global town halls. Unfortunately, we're no longer doing in-person events, but we'll get back to that and uh, we look forward to that. Uh, let me just close uh, my comments if I could, uh, Carl, uh, noting that David and I have talked about uh, uh, the issues of, of journalism around the world and uh, repression of journalists and uh, the disinformation campaigns. So we'll have to have David back to talk about what's going on. Uh, we talked about uh, Maria Ressa in, in the Philippines and, and some other cases that uh, journalists uh, are, are conscious of and, and the rest of us should be too. Now we can do a whole show on Russia. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, David, thank you. There's I really enjoyed it. It was great seeing you. And uh, Pat, thank you. And thank you to everybody who stayed tuned. Well, thank you very much, Pat and Carl. I'll have to invite you on my show as well. I'd love to have you. Love to turn the tables. No, no problem. <laughs> Happy to do it. All right, everybody take care. Thank, uh, 
thank Bye. everybody uh, this evening for coming and uh, spending time with us. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing another edition of uh, Global National with Carl Dean. And uh, everyone be, uh, be safe. Have a good evening. Good evening.